اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ dear viewers the show think about it we left off last week talking about the difference between debating and arguing and how people have mistaken these two concepts and in fact there's a very thin line between becoming a barbarian being an uneducated person to becoming somebody with a more educated perspective and before we begin today's show we're going to talk about the indigenous population once again the atrocities happening in Palestine once again the atrocities happening in Kashmir once again and the atrocities that are found around the world with Uyghur Muslims as well in China first off with the indigenous population we hear that the body counts are continuously increasing and we hear about the atrocities that took place and if you take a look at Canadian history and the price that the natives of this land that we call home have had to pay not only do our hearts go out for them but our efforts should as well and when i say efforts i just don't mean financially financially a lot of things can be done yes true but moral support support when it comes down to businesses support when it comes down to opportunities that are opening up to make a more inclusive society granted the government might have its quota on things but to give them a voice is what we're looking for because believe it or not the indigenous population has been screaming out their stories for a very long time with very little focus or very little attention from the general public all the way up to people who are sitting in government seats and officials so it's time for us to unite and it's time for us to talk about the atrocities that are happening within our own backyard and hopefully support them in every way possible our hearts go out for them to the new palestinian dilemmas that are taking place well every single day has a new dilemma for them every single day has a new atrocity for them whether it be throwing garbage and sewage water on Masjid al-Aqsa which is on the Palestinian side to the fact that the new government of the Israeli occupation the occupied territory within Palestine violating the ceasefire killing people innocent people children and marking it off as a defense strategy which still doesn't make sense i have no idea how or why the world is so foolish for the lack of a better word that you cannot see that a country that does not have an army that does not have a military that does not have weapons being shipped to it in billions of dollars worth of amounts such as the idf is is being called a terrorist organization or group hamas is a is, a, is it's an old story it's something that can't be fed off forever However, IDF terrorism taking place, the fact that you have IDF soldiers who are laughing and v- a variety of videos available online where they're laughing after shooting people, after they shot a kid on the head, headshot, subhanallah, astaghfirullah. And the kid's legs went up in the air. They said, "Look at that. The legs went up in the air." In their Hebrew language. Off of Benjamin Netanyahu, the previous prime minister of the state, the occupied state of Palestine, saying that you bomb them and you kill them until they can't retaliate anymore you bomb them and you kill them until you silence them this is a person who doesn't believe in a two state theory this is a person who doesn't believe in anything of the sort now i can't urge this enough for people to open up their eyes and have a look but i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all those people who are in power may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them hidayah for all those people who have cro- who have caused atrocities to happen May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them what they deserve in this dunya. It won't be long until another war will be happening. It won't be long until another final decision or verdict would have to be made. It won't be long until we'll be seeing a massive change in this world because we're moving towards atrocities. We're moving towards a more deluded and diluted and deteriorated society, which brings me to our show. We're talking about the family system today. Dear viewers, before World War 1, there have been many researches and surveys done before World War 1. That means prior to 1913, 1911, the 19th century itself up until the early 20th century, right before World War 1 started and Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary. The survey showed that a lot of people were working not only so they could put food on the table but so that they would get done with their responsibility and spend time with their families 
Children at the time were called little workers. This is an actual title that was given to them. That means children not only went out and helped their parents at work, but were a huge part of society. There are people who are active. There are people who actually used to go out and work as well. Nowadays, under so many scrutinization of systems and policy development and changing, people would call that child labor. But when a child consensually, mutually, and fully intentfully goes out to help his father out in the farm fields or help him weld things or help him go and raise horses or animals, that is a child that is learning a new skill, a new trait. And children are sponges, as we've said. The earlier they learn, the better they are. So in these surveys of the past prior to the First World War, we have seen that a society was built on family values. Family values included disciplinary issues as well. Now discipline doesn't mean hitting children. Discipline means being able to communicate with children and holding them accountable for right and wrong, praising them when it was due and holding them accountable when it was due. After World War I, what ended up happening is, is that because conscription was in order. Now, conscription is a word which basically means the phenomena of enlisting people into the army by force. So when a country goes into war and they don't have enough military people, they go to the civilians, they go to the normal people, and they ask them to join in the forces in the army. When they do this, you have less people who are available back home, especially the male force. And so women stepped up. We heard about World War I and World War II, where women started doing a lot of jobs that men used to do. Welding, becoming police officers, running factories, and becoming factory workers as well. Now, as time passed, women got the vote as well, the women's suffrage movement, all good and great. We saw a development in society. But now, we're going to talk about post-World War I, post-World War II. We're going to talk about all the things that happened until modern day 2021, 21st century. There's a man by the name of Richard Gill. He wrote a book called Posterity Lost in 1998. Basically, allow me to summarize things into one statement if I can. There was a time when people worked for their family. Now, People work for a promised future of development. What that basically means is that everybody's working. Everybody's out there trying to do a job, thinking that tomorrow a better day is going to come. So they're compromising their today. Compromising their today means a lot of things. For example, in the 21st century, both parents, it's, it's very common. Statistics show, especially in Canada, North America, and well, these are for North American statistics. And I'll come to the world as well. Almost 60%, 60% of families, that means people who have children, both parents are working. That means more than half of the people, more than half of parents are out there working both, mother and father. Which means who takes care of the kids? They're put into daycares, nannies are hired, they're sent to preschool, they're kept busy. Which means that their communication and their interaction time, their connectivity with their parents has reduced by 43% as compared to the 1980s. 43% decline of parents interacting with their children from the 1980s to 2021. Now this is an alarming number, a staggering number in fact. Something that should be a red flag. Unfortunately, it's not given that much focus. So what ends up happening is that children and parents don't have that strong of a bond. And so that term generation gap exists. Everybody talks about the generation gap. What does the generation gap mean? Oh, my parents don't understand me. They come from another time. I don't understand them. They don't understand new things. They're not tech savvy, they're not this. You try to blame and label things around you to justify the generation gap. However, the truth is, is that parents don't give that much time to their children. And when they don't give that much time to their children, obviously, they're not going to understand their children. When they don't understand their children, obviously, they're not going to gel well together. In fact, I'll give you a stat a statistics from the Middle East. From the 1970s up until 2018, almost every single Arab family in the Middle East, when I say the Middle East, I, I, I'm specifically looking at the GCC, the Gulf Countries Corporation, which include Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Oman. 
Most of these countries and most of their people used to have nannies and maids in their homes who they used to bring about from different countries, whether mostly the Philippines, but from Thailand, from Indonesia, from uh, other countries as well, they used to be coming, mostly from the Orient side. Those nannies and maids actually brought up their children. It is said that the children had more of a relationship with their nannies and their maids than they did with their parents because they barely saw their parents. Now let's talk about the family system, which includes family values. In family values, one thing that I urge the Canadian government, governments around the world, Pakistan, India, America, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, all these countries who are trying to be reformists, who are changing their policies, is that now new policies are coming afoot where a husband and wife cannot have that much of a contradiction or conflict between each other. Any issue happens, the wife calls the police or some form of authority and the husband has hell to pay. A child, if he's scolded by his parents or if he's told by his or her parents that they must do this or they're held accountable, they call child services. This is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. The family value system is breaking apart. A parent is a person who is different from every other adult you have out there. A parent is a person who's supposed to not only nurture this child, but also discipline this child. Discipline doesn't always mean raise your hand. Discipline means explain. It means use a force of your voice. Your intonation could rise. You could shout at a child when they do something wrong. And all of these things are just to reinforce the understanding to the child that something wrong has occurred from their part. And if something incorrect or something that is unethical has happened from the child's part, the child owns up to it, hopefully apologizes for it, and doesn't repeat it. And this repetitious nature keeps going forward. In schools, teachers are not allowed to uh, scold children anymore. Go to the student counselor's office, and the counselor, God knows what they do and what they say, and whether they get to the bottom of this, I hope they do. But the entire value of family is deteriorating day by day because new rules, policies, and different things are being implemented which are not healthy for a family. In fact, we have a small idea and a proposal. It's called the Parental Bill of Rights. This is something that Richard Gill, the man who wrote the book Posterity Lost, talks about. And we're going to talk more about it after the break. Stay tuned. Think about it. पूरे ऑन्टेरियो में लाखों लोग अपनी कोविड 19 की वैक्सीन हासिल कर चुके हैं हेल्थ कैनेडा की मंजूर शुदा तमाम वैक्सीन महफूज और अस्पतालों डॉक्टर्स के दफातर फार्मेसी और अवामी वैक्सीनेशन के मुकाम पर हासिल है अपना किरदार अदा करें अपनी वैक्सीन हासिल करें तीन सौ जुबानों में मदद के लिए ऑन्टेरियो डॉट सी ए स्लैश बुक वैक्सीन पर जाए या एक आठ 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 नौ 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 छः चार आठ आठ पर कॉल करें KK Travel believe in providing everyone the first class customer service. We take care not only for your etiquette but dignity and respect as well. We are available for you anytime on WhatsApp even while you are in Pakistan or any other destination. KK Travel's guarantee lowest prices and are open to price match any airline. We are KK Travel's under supervision of Gas Khan and 905-367-9433. or visit www.kaskhantravels.com Pakistan ka sabse mashhoor extra long grain Mughal basmati rice available in both white and silver home delivery is available subject to minimum order and radius also available at your neighborhood fresh co mazid malumat ke liye aaj hi contact kare 5146 3-0-4-8-0 पर या ऑर्डर करें हमारे फेसबुक से बनाए ये रमजान और भी खास मुगल बासमती के साथ द प्रीमियम चॉइस फॉर प्रीमियम टेस्ट सलामकुम वेलकम बैक टू द शो थिंक अबाउट इट वी लेफ्ट ऑफ टॉकिंग अबाउट द फैमिली सिस्टम एंड वी लेफ्ट ऑफ टॉकिंग अबाउट हाउ इट इज डिटीरिंग डे बाय डे वाई इज इट डिटीरिंग इन वट आर द कॉजेज ऑफ दिस डिटीरेशन For this, we have to go back in time. When parents, both parents start working, who's taking care of the kids? 
the kids are left off at daycares, preschools. I'm not saying they're bad institutions. I'm not saying parents shouldn't be doing this. Obviously, all of this trickles down to the government, to the expenses, to the inflation, to the economic crises that happen, and the fact that parents have to go out and provide all of a sudden and go out of their skins and work two jobs if they have to, just so they can provide basic necessities. It's not safe enough or enough for a government to provide child benefit to a family. A child benefit doesn't cover everything. A child benefit should also be a security for a parent in their head knowing that their child is growing properly, has the proper attention. If you send a child to a preschool or a Montessori or a daycare, do you believe that a person working there, I have nothing against these professionals, they're doing a good job, they're out there to earn a paycheck just like everybody else is. But do you believe they're going to take care of your child the same way you would take care of your child? Do they think they would show the same concern if a child falls down or needs that care that you would? The answer is no, they wouldn't. Teachers, a lot of teachers have it on their shoulders that they're the parents. A lot of parents, they come to school and they tell teachers that you're like a father or you're like a mother to my child. And you must be it and you must take care of them. I'm busy with my business. Your first business, dear viewers and people who have this notion, your first business is your child. Your first business is your family. You take care of your family, then you go off and you do whatever else you want to do. And may Allah put barakah in whatever it is that you do so that you may give time to your family. Our beautiful religion, Islam, teaches us something as well. A lot of riwayah, a lot of references, and a lot of teachings that come through state that from the time your child is born up until they're seven or eight, I'm not sure what the age was, but you shower them with love and affection. You try to get them everything they want. Even if you can't afford something, it's more love and affection. It's to be their friend. If your kids like watching cartoons, sit down and watch cartoons with them you might actually end up developing an interest that your child has. That's the biggest issue, right? Kids like watching cartoons at times or series at times, and their parents come home and they flip the channel and it's time for the adults watching their news and whatever it is. How about, how about you sit down and enjoy some time with your child? I remember uh, when my son was approximately eight, nine months old and we used to watch nursery rhymes and they used to be on YouTube and on, on TV. I used to sit down and watch them with them. So did my wife. And I'm sure a lot of other parents do that too. In fact, statistics show that quite a few parents do that. And so you end up developing an interest with your child. You know his nursery rhymes, you know her nursery rhymes, you know what they like, and you can relate to them better. And that's what makes you a very strong part of their life because they know that you can relate to them. But the moment you start saying kids have something and their interest is different, my interest is different, I'm not gonna indulge, I have my own thing, and kids like this, then you're creating a gap. Obviously, there's gonna be a generation gap. If your son or daughter likes to watch a cartoon by the name of Paw Patrol, Sonic Boom, or likes watching, you know, Coco Melon or something like that, sit down and watch it with them. Sit down and watch it with her. You might end up actually growing an interest. You might end up actually forming a bond with your child. And so that generation gap goes out the window. And your child can trust you. And so you give them with as much love and affection as you can. And when they turn seven or eight, up until the time they become balikh. Balikh means up until the time they become virtual and actual adults. Not by the law of 18 years old, but by the time they're 13, 14 years old. At that time, by that time, you teach them accountability as well. You don't give them everything they want. You teach them some discipline. If they do something wrong, they know that there's an accountability behind it. If they do something wrong, they're not getting dessert. They can't watch their cartoons. They can't play their gaming consoles or if something is there, there's, there's a consequence based on everything. If they do something right, yes, they can get that half an hour more of TV time, that half an hour more of playing a game, or that new game they really want, if they accomplish this goal and they do it well, you'll go out and buy that game for them, or nowadays things are available online and you can purchase things for them online. But at the end of the day, there's a form of accountability and a form of credit. Both of these things need to go hand in hand. So by the time they're 13, 14 years old, they become your wazirs, your ministers, your khalifas, your companions. That means whenever you make a decision, new furniture has to come to the house, you ask your daughter or son, what do you think of this furniture? What do you think of that? Include them in your decision making. And that makes a well-rounded individual. That gives your children confidence. That makes them grow. Unfortunately, statistics say that this isn't happening. 80% of people 80, 
80% around the world off of seven and a half billion to eight billion of a population of people. They do not take interest in what their children have interest in, especially those people who are parents. They believe that their, parent, their, their, their children, when they watch cartoons, it's a waste of time. When they play games, it's a waste of time. When they do something else, it's a waste of time. So they don't really give them that bit of credit off of whatever their interest lies in. They believe that their interest is meaningless. But if you actually see that you take an interest in their interest, then all of a sudden it's meaningful. I don't know if that made sense, but it becomes meaningful. And when you're able to do that, your bond between you and your child goes stronger. And that is the essence of today. Today, we're talking about how children cannot be scolded at. They cannot even be hit by their parents. As rough or as weird as that might sound to people out there, oh my God, somebody's hitting their child. If you hit your child lightly and you say, you've done something wrong, son. What is this? What are you doing? All right, if you pat him on the back, but kind of hard, and you tell them, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to touch that. It's not yours. It's COVID times. Don't touch other people's toys and things. Do you really think that that's bad? It doesn't damage the self-confidence of a child. It does not. In fact, if anything, it makes the child understand accountability. But these small things we're not allowed to do anymore. And children can call child services and cause the parents to have a big issue. So parents are not allowed to parent anymore. Husband and wives are not allowed to have conflicts anymore. And grandparents are not even in the equation anymore because they're in old homes. They're not given the respect that they should be given. So you tell me, this child who's going to grow up, you think they're going to respect you when they see that their own grandparents are in you know, old the home cares and all those things? No, they're not going to care for you. But guess what? Police can do whatever they want to. You've seen TikTok, you've seen what's happening, you've seen stories about people dying, people being detained, traffic violations off of a toss coin. So they did a coin toss to see if they're going to arrest somebody or not. So police and authorities, government officials can get away with anything. They can beat a person and say that it was self-defense. Just like Israel, the defense forces that they have, which are actually a terrorist group, claims to do with innocent Palestinian people who don't even have an army, who don't even have artillery, who have stones and rocks to defend themselves, with IDF being supplied with billion dollars worth of missiles and bombs and tanks by the US and God knows how many other countries, including Canada. Canada, wake up, do something about it, stop your aid. Stop your aid, for the love of God. Stop your aid before it's too late. Because today is Palestinians, tomorrow is gonna be you. So, what this happens, what, what ends up happening is that the family system deteriorates. When the family system deteriorates, there's no value anymore. You should be able to yell and scold your child. You will see that there's a household which has multiple boys and girls, and the eldest comes home a bit late, passes their curfew, and the parent is scolding them and telling them that they've passed their curfew. And the oldest child ends up replying and retaliating and entering into an argument. We talked about argument and debating, right? You remember what that was, right? A barbaric side of things. So when the younger sibling looks at their older sibling doing this, and then when they have an issue between each other, and the older sibling is scolding the younger sibling, and the younger sibling is having an argument with them, the older sibling gets really angry. Oh, I'm older than you, don't you know that? Well, guess what? If you don't have any respect for our parents, why should I have respect for you? It's a butterfly effect. When you argue in front of your kids, your kids learn to argue. When you dis disagree with people and you break rules and you show that there's no accountability, you show unethical behavior, your children are learning this. They're feeding off of you. And thus, they emulate it. They copy it. They mirror it. Then you can't complain. You can't blame anybody. Because whenever you point a finger and you blame at somebody, they're three pointing right back at you. Remember that. What do we do to get out of this? Richard Gill was a person who was an economist and he was an economic professor at the University of Harvard. And he wrote the book called Posterity Lost and he talked about family values and how the family theory about how the family is declining now. He talked about something called the Parental Bill of Rights, which is actually a pretty decent idea. It's that when people become parents and they have to take care of their kids, they feel as though they're at a loss academically and professionally because they're not working anymore and they're taking care of kids. Whether it be the mother or the father, usually the mother has to make that sacrifice. But sometimes, occasionally, you will find fathers doing the same. 
Governments should understand and realize when children are born that parents have new responsibilities and role profiles. Treat it as experience, where you're actually teaching leadership skills to people. We're actually doing management. We're actually doing budget restraints and management as well. Whether you're dealing with recurring and non-recurring funds. These are actual things that people are doing in their families. And these are things that the government knows about because you're getting the child benefit. You're going and registering your child. You're getting a child birth certificate. The government knows you got kids. When you have the consensus that comes up, you talk about how many family members you have. You send that forward, whether it be online or on paper. So if the government knows everything about you, they know that you are tied up, you have responsibility, you have a new chapter in your life starting, you are a parent now. So the government should also give you credit for that. When I say credit, I mean actual credit, university credit, experience credit. Make sure that that could go down on your resume, that I am a father, I am a mother, and this is what I have done as a parent. And that actually feeds into you finding a job. Believe it or not, if this type of stuff is put into the more professional domain, a lot of people will actually enjoy being parents and take their responsibilities seriously. They will actually end up indulging with their children. They will actually end up understanding their children better. Their children will understand them better. And so you could bridge that generation gap. This is one proposal. And it was proposed in 1998 or even a little bit before that. I'm surprised it never caught on. I'm surprised people take this so lightly. Being a parent is not a small thing. Being a grandparent is not a small thing. Even being a child. These are all responsibilities. As a presenter, I have responsibilities in my role profile. As an educator, I have a role profile, responsibilities. I'm not asking the government to pay parents for the job that they're doing of apparently taking care of children even though that might not be a bad idea. But I am saying give them credit for it. I am saying provide them the opportunity to include their experience into it. And you know when people say, tell us a story of when you had to show leadership skills. Stories with your children will bear the most best examples of leadership skills ever. If you take a look at even history, even Abrahamic religions, right? If you're a Jew, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Christian, these are Abrahamic religions. Ibrahim alayhi salam at the time when, you know why we celebrate Eid al-Adha which just passed. It was a sacrifice, right? We sacrificed an animal, it was a penalty for him to sacrifice his own son. And how leadership qualities, skills, sacrifice, you know, compensation as well as, you know, compromising comes in. These are all leadership qualities that parents have every single day. To all of those mothers out there who are at home taking care of kids, my salute to you, you are super people. Because you have more experience of life, of being a manager, of being a leader, of being a role model, of being a mentor, of actually understanding what finances are, of understanding what economics are, of understanding what planning is, of understanding what home economics are, of understanding how practical skills actually feed into life are. Learning a discipline in university and going off to work is one thing. There's nothing wrong with it. But becoming a parent is a barakah, it's a blessing. And being able to uphold that role correctly is something worth praising. My salute to all you parents out there. My advice, spend more time with your kids. Make their interests your interests. My advice to every single government out there, whether it be my own Canadian government, any other government that's listening, any political leader out there, any minister, the Minister of Education, even though I'm not a very big fan of all the different performances that have happened, the Minister of Economics, the Minister of Homes, the Minister of Housing and Development, the Minister of Municipality, all of you, think about it. If you guys are parents, if all of you are parents, you know what mothers are going through at home. You know what some fathers are going through at home who are stay-at-home dads, stay-at-home moms, homemakers is what we call them. These are people who have so much experience off of the strength of becoming parents. You know, improvisation, thinking on your feet, you know, must be able to work in a stressful environment, must be able to work in a fast-paced environment. All these different quotes that you find when you go on job descriptions when you're applying for things. Don't you think a parent has to do all that? Give them credit for it. Give them experience for it. Acknowledge it. If you guys already know that they're parents, they're going to ministries, they're going to service Ontario, they're going to ministries, they're documenting everything down, you already know their, their condition. Give them some credit for their condition. I hope this thing passes and I hope this thing goes through because I'm pushing it. Think about it. Take care. Have a great week.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته